Okay. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Uh, so picking up from yesterday, uh, the story so far is that we've got our uh, virtual machine uh, inside which we're setting up uh, effectively our development environment and we're using Docker container to uh, run a Queemu emulator inside which we're going to run our Raspberry Pi image. And we've written a short script uh, intended to be run on the main virtual machine that will patch any Raspberry Pi image we get uh, to uh, add in a marker SSH file to the boot. Uh, that will tell uh, Raspbian uh, that when it boots it should start up the SSH server. And yesterday we were working on getting in uh, a public and private certificate so that uh, uh, our SSH from within the container um, would connect, yeah, connect to the uh, Raspberry Pi without us needing to enter a username and password. And I ran into a problem uh, and it turned out this was due to the fact that I'm being a dumbass, <laughs> as these things often do. Uh, and what I was doing was, uh, uh, okay, the script down here in the bottom left is the modified version. But what I was doing was I was doing this uh, chmod, but I had done a chmod of 600 uh, for a recursively below the SSH directory. The problem with that, of course, is that doesn't allow the execute attribute on the SSH directory itself, which means that we couldn't that the Pi account uh, couldn't read its own SSH directory. Uh, so, <laughs> a small problem. Anyway, small modification later. Um, and that is that uh, you do the chmod 700 on the directory itself, and then you chmod 600 everything underneath it, which includes the authorised keys. Uh, and when I was doing that, uh, so so this is, this is the construction of the authorised keys, which of course basically is the public key for um, the public private key pair that we need for the SSH. So the public key goes into our authorized keys. Uh, and uh, in the process of doing that, I thought it would also be a very good idea to make sure that the Pi account owned the SSH directory and everything in it. Now, of course, we can't just churn Pi uh, because we're running this script from the Vagrant virtual machine, which doesn't have a Pi account. So we need to be able to extract uh, the details of the Pi account ownership from the mounted Pi image that we're patching. Uh, so we can't just churn Pi colon Pi, in other words, the user Pi with a group Pi, because uh, those things won't exist at the time that we want to do that churn. So in order to do this, what we have to do is extract the actual user ID and group ID. We extract those from the uh, from the password file. Okay, so that's what we're doing in this line. This line is a bit of black magic fuckery um, where uh, the orc is being used to match the pi command sorry, the Pi account details from etc. password in the Raspberry Pi image. Uh, and when it finds that, we know then that fields three and four uh, of the very first part of that. Uh, uh, how to explain this clearly? OK, the, the first item uh, within the line in the etc. password is going to be the details about the account name, password, and the uh, user and group ID. Uh, now, by saying that the field separator is a colon, we can ignore all the other rubbish on that line, because all we're really interested in is the first four items, and that is the first item, which is the name of the account, uh, the second item, which is the password, which will be an X because we're using shadow password file, which is pretty much standard nowadays. Uh, and then items three and four are the user ID and the group ID, which are the things we actually want. So we can use this awk command to extract those details. 
Now the issue is I want to be able to get those details back into the script I'm currently running. Uh, and one way of doing this, and it is just one way, I mean there are, there are several ways of doing it, but the, the one way I, I like to do it, providing I trust the source of data, uh, and in this case it's the etc password file within that image, um, so I'm going to extract that data into two variables, UID and GID, but I'm going to print those out as if they were commands and then redirect that into a source command. So the dot at the beginning of this line is effectively the source command. Uh, and so that will be evaluated as UID equals some number, semicolon GID equals whatever number. <clears throat> and, but it will be evaluated in the context of this script, not in the context of the shell that the orc is running. Hmm. Oh, you can you can show this working. If we if we go to uh, okay, let's go across to the uh, virtual machine. Uh, let's uh, let's get out of there for a second. Right. Okay. So if I do uh, okay, so here in the top right here on the virtual machine, if I just cut out the etc password file. Uh, so this is the the etc password file on the virtual machine uh, and within that we obviously don't have a Pi account that's what we're talking about but we do have this vagrant account which is the, the context we're currently running in and what we're interested in in this th this line of the etc file is this first thing here okay so everything up to this comma in, in actual fact we're only interested in these two numbers here okay so the first one is the user ID and the second one is the group ID Okay, and the first part of that is the account name. So this awk command, okay, if I just take this awk command uh, and actually type it in, so awk, okay, and then we give it an awk script. So the first thing we're saying is uh, begin, which it, begin is a special marker for awk, which says run this next block uh, before you do anything else, okay? And we're setting this special variable fs, which is the field separator, and we're saying make the field separator a colon, okay, uh, by default it's a space. Uh, so what we're doing is we're saying treat this line here, okay, but separate it using the colons. Well obviously all we're going to do in this case is separate one field here, because there's a colon there, and we're going to separate this vagrant comma 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 as a but, most importantly, we're going to separate out that number and that number as items three and four. Okay, so that's what that first bit does. And then we're saying, right now, any line which matches. Now, in the actual script, we're doing pi, but obviously we don't have a pi account, so let's do it for vagrant. And if I was being absolutely you know, spot on about this, I would put a colon there. But, uh, it, you don't have to be that strict in this context. Okay, and then we say, right, if you match vagrant at the beginning of the line, then run this command. Okay, so the command we're running is print. Okay, and then we're going to print out the UID equals. So we're going to do an assignment. Okay, and then we're going to do dollar uh, three, which is that item. So that's one, two, three. Okay, and then we need to put in a uh, semicolon we're going to separate the UID command from this GID command okay and we say make that equal to and then we say dollar four and we have to put these outside the quotes because otherwise they'll be interpreted as uh, the uh, shell script dollar uh, three dollar four and so on which are the input um, uh, arguments uh, so we need dollar three and dollar four in here so that they're actually the orc dollar three and dollar four. Uh, Got to keep your context straight. Okay, and then the final semicolon is just a precaution. Okay, and then we close the bracket, which means the closing of that block to be run when we match vagrant, and then the closing of the script. So if I run that command now, what we see is. 
why is it why is it running so it's, oh i haven't given it anything to process <laughs> slash etc slash password uh, oh it's really just going to stand it in let's try that again slash etc slash password my bad okay so what we've done here is we said right run this this orc script okay against this file and so what it's done is it's matched this vagrant line and it's extracted those two things and put them into this string okay now what the rest of this does okay this bracket down here okay so going, going back to our actual script these brackets uh, tell it to run that all command in a subshell then we take the output of that subshell which is this uid gid pair okay which is actually just a string and we redirect that as if it was from standard in into our script and then this dot uh, can also be written as uh, source okay the dot is the more positive way of doing it okay and what that says is run the script i'm about to give you which is remember just this line here okay run this script in the context of the currently running script so effectively it's as if we typed in uid equals semicolon gid equals semicolon in this script which is a very long way of getting the uid and gid for our chosen. okay now why have i put it in these two statements inside these curly braces well it's because i've got shell check running on this system uh, and shell check was throwing a couple of errors uh, or a couple of warnings this sc1090 was warning me that it couldn't follow this embedded shell script okay uh, so it couldn't it couldn't do any checking uh, within that script well that's fair enough uh, but i don't want it to check within that script because it's not actually a, a, a shell that shell check will check it's almost like a tongue twister um so yeah so the so we don't want it to follow that anyway so we're going to ignore that issue uh so we want it to disable that sc 1090 the SC2154 was because these variables here, UID and GID, were considered to be uninitialized. In other words, in violation of the uninitialized variables rule. Okay, but of course that's not true because they are actually initialized by the time you reach this at runtime. They're not syntactically, they're not being initialized because they're sort of hidden away. In, the initialization is sort of hidden away inside this or command. Um, but because they are hidden away, it means that they are defined at runtime, so it won't trigger the set minus u problem, uh, sorry, in a directive at the beginning of the thing. In other words, uh, you know, uh, the script won't balk at runtime because uid and gid will actually be set. But shell check, because it can't follow the logic of this, uh, says uid and gid aren't being initialized um, and throws a warning. I can show you that by if I just delete that line, you see immediately I get these two errors. Uh, so I get the two warnings on the on the left here. These and the dash dashes in let yellow. Down the bottom here you can see SC1090 can't follow non-constant source, which is basically telling me I can't analyze what's inside this shell. Okay, uh, uh, and the uh, the second one. Uh, is is the sc2154 which is showing the uid is referenced but not assigned that's talking about the uid and gid okay so putting that comment back disables those okay so why are they put inside these curly braces well i could have put uh the shell check disable one just uh just above this command and one just above the chone so two comments okay the SC1090 just above uh, this line and the, uh, uh, the disabling of 2154 just above this line. However, what I decided to do instead was 
put them inside curly braces to make them a single block and then put the shell check before that block to say just disable these for the purposes of this block now the reason for that is that shell, shell check directives only apply to the very next statement uh, and curly brace blocks are considered to be a single entity for the purposes of that disable command or uh, disable directive so okay so that, that hopefully explains what's going on here okay uh, so the, these two lines are just extracting the actual UID and, and GID of the Pi account within the image that we've mounted and then setting the ownership of the .ssh file to be that otherwise it would be root because this command is being run as root okay uh, and then down here we do the correct mode changes uh, in order to make sure that ssh and authorized keys are accessible but also protected uh, otherwise what you find is the ssh system tends to throw lots of warnings to say oh you know your, your ssh is not properly protected and then uh yeah so so that's it so now this script actually does what it was intended to do which is that it protects the um uh, sorry it sets the ssh keys correctly so if i just go back over here okay and we oh, i'll go down here to the supervisor one. Oh, i can also take out uh, i can take out that set dd now okay so uh, okay so, uh, so i don't need that trace anymore Okay, so let's uh, run the patch pi on the file system image. Okay, so no output, which is fine. Oh, you want your belly rub, mate? Okay, so now when we run that, so we just run that. And then up here, uh, we need. Uh, Docker container 5 for we're running in. So let's run, let's exec into that. Okay. So inside the container now, uh, we've got the SSH, which remember was um was the drop bear SSH that we've done. So we can add in minus y, minus y, uh, minus i, and we want the ID RSN, uh, which is the, the private certificate that we generated, which we've already preloaded onto the container that was back in the Docker build, remember? Uh, and then <laughs> we are pi account to the 127.0001 uh, and port 5022, which you remember is the port being presented by the Quimu emulator 5022 which is mapped to port 22 in the Raspberry Pi image so when the Raspberry Pi runs and it starts up the SSH server it attaches to port 22 Quimu then presents that as 5022 within the container so we're now connecting to that but because we've got all of these certificates in place we won't be prompted uh, for a password mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're not going to settle either. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm, let me see, has it started up? Okay, SSH server hasn't started just yet. Ah, there we go, secure shell server. So now 
when we connect it says oh, oh, one too many zeros got carried away right so it should now connect us straight into the Raspberry Pi without us having to provide a password looks promising And there we go. Success. Like I said, it's it's slow because we're running on a we're not, we're running a Raspberry Pi image on an emulated machine uh, in a container on a virtual machine which is running on a host. So you know, <laughs> all things considered, uh, we're okay. Okay. Now then, what I haven't done. Is I haven't disabled uh, passwords or anything like that. Okay, this is if you like, this is the minimum to allow us to actually get connected in. The reason for that, or at least my reasoning, is I want to alter what's on the base image as little as I can in order to achieve what I want to do. Because this, remember, the whole point of doing this is to offer this raw Raspberry Pi image for us to then install whatever custom installation we want to do. OK, so the next step is for us to look at uh, the continuous integration chain uh, and the tool we're going to use so that we can start designing the solution that will say, right, OK, taking the bits we've now got, that is uh, the patching of a raw image to produce an image which, when booted, will stop with an SSH server in, in it. Uh, being able to pass that in then to another build stage, which will say, right, take this set of scripts and apply them to this image uh, via um, you know, SSH uh, so that the image is further customized. And then out of that will, be, will come our customized image. So our build chain will allow us then to have as many of these as we like with all sorts of different uh, scripts to customize one standardized image through whatever customized script we want to produce n number of images which can then be taken and put onto micro SD, plugged into our Raspberry Pis, and we're off and running. Um, so whenever a new version of the scripts or a new version of the base Raspberry Pi comes out, uh, it will just go through our continuous integration process and come out the other end as images ready to be put onto Raspberry Pis. Uh, of course, the other thing we can do, uh, getting this automated pipeline, is that once we've got these Raspberry Pi images and this preview that's able to boot them, uh, we can run them through various tests. So we'll, we'll look at that as well uh, once we start building up our pipeline. Right, OK, so that, if you like, is step one done. So let's uh, be good little munchkins. And uh, do you know what? You kicking my hands makes it even more challenging. Uh, so let's uh, stop that 54 machine. Uh, sorry, container. OK. So. Um, Getting out of our uh, virtual machine for a second. So we're now back on the. Uh, do I want to do that here? I suppose I do, don't I? Yeah, so let's get out of. Um, uh, let's get out of. Yeah, and so this is our Pi Builder project. Uh, and we've got, right, so we've got the uh, uh, notes, which I'm actually developing somewhere else. Probably don't want to bother with those because they're just scratch notes. But we've got the Vagrant file, which creates uh, yeah, uh, whoops, this virtual machine, top right. Well, top right and bottom left because it's just the, yeah, that's just the root account on the virtual machine. So the virtual machine on the left is created by that Vagrant file. Uh, in actual fact, it's that vagrant file plus uh, 
the provisioning script. Um, then uh, we've also got within this secure directory, we've got the public and private key for the Raspberry Pi. Now, we don't have to treat those particularly securely because this is just literally just to make that image available within the container so that we can customize it. Um, if you really wanted to be secure about this, then you could make those keys available from some sort of secrets manager. In fact, we'll probably end up having to deal with that later for when we're putting on our custom builds, if there's secrets and things to be put on there. Obviously, we don't want to put those into public repositories, but we do want to make them available from a secrets manager. Um, but for now, it, it really, it's a, it's a small, import okay it's, it's as important for example as uh, vagrant okay vagrant has a very public private public care key pair key uh, that is used to do the vagrant ssh so from the host to the vagrant machine um, it's just not worth stressing about at this point so uh, so that's the provisioning the secure and the vagrant file all go to uh, making up one half of this stuff, uh, uh, the patch, uh, the patch pi and the secure are used to put the public key and the starting of the SSH server onto whatever image you provide, and the Docker file builds the uh, drop bear uh, SSH client and SCP to go into a container. Uh, along with the public secure key uh, and those become the container that we will then run in order to uh, uh, start up our Raspberry Pi. Cool. Okay, so that's as far as we've got so far. So what we're going to do now, because uh, at the moment this this is all just floating around, okay, so what we're going to do is do a git init uh, to start up a repository uh, and uh, git and we want to add everything except for the notes. So if we just add everything and then Okay, uh, and then we can do uh, git remove staged, up staged, cached on notes. Okay, mm, right, so now uh, we've got scheduled to be added is the Docker file, the Bacon file, patch by provisioning main, which is the main provisioning script, and the two secure keys. Okay, so we will now git commit m, and we'll be very boring and call that our initial commit, because there's not really much to be said, and it's a commit, not a commit. Okay, so that's all now uh, effectively baselined into our uh, uh, into our git. Now before I carry on I'm going to uh, just put us onto a dev branch so that when I commit now it'll go onto the dev branch rather than on the master branch and we'll treat the master branch as the last release. Okay so uh, let's do git checkout branch dev. Okay and now we're on the dev branch. Kill. Right. What we haven't done yet is set this up as a remote repository. So uh, yeah, let's do that now. Okay. So if I go uh, over to the browser and we'll set it up on GitLab. Uh, and uh, let me see. Yeah, this is my sort of vagrant account. So what we'll do is let's set up 
uh, is a new group called streams. Uh, and these will be my stream project. Uh, and we'll make them public. Uh, right. So now we'll create a new project and we'll call it uh, we'll call it we'll create a blank project. And what should we call what should we call this project? Uh, it's called almost oh, called Pi Builder. Okay, uh, and we'll make it public. And uh, yeah, we won't initialize it with a readme. We'll, we'll do that ourselves in a minute. Okay, so create the project. Now, what we do want to do is we want to tie uh, this new project repository with uh, this. Okay, so you can see we're not tracking anything. So we want to say uh, git remote uh, and we want to add uh, okay uh, and then we can do uh, we can just push it straight away, can I push my view origin master? Uh, we can do a git push. Okay, so we, we've, we've pushed the master, but we are working now, remember, on the dev branch, which uh, if we do a, uh, a git log, you can see that that's... Uh, pretty much the same thing because uh, this okay so we can see here that the head is on dev okay uh, which is the same thing as origin master which is the same thing as master right so but our dev is not being tracked in the main project which is exactly what we want because we want all of the rubbish that we stick on our dev branch uh, we'll stay there until we clean it up and get it ready to be pushed to be merged down onto the master and then we can push that up to the pro uh, so you only see the nice clean stuff up on the master okay so let's go back to uh, pi builder and if i just refresh that page we should see Ta -da! okay so there's our files uh, and now uh, actually uh, let me just uh, do a git checkout master because we're going to switch back to the master just for a second. Uh, uh, check out. Uh, there we go. Because uh, what I want to do is just put a readme and we'll, we'll use MD because uh, markdown is as easy as anything. So uh, let's do. Uh, uh, this is a uh, project developed during my first string sessions showing how uh, ooh, in a combination of on the virtual machines and containers I can automate a development of Raspberry Pi images. Right, okay. Well, it's not really development of them, is it? It's the build. Uh, let's say... Um, uh, is that really a good... Uh, so building. Uh, uh, anyway, we can check that. Okay, so uh, let's just do a... Use. Oops. Uh, let's do... Uh, uh, a use. 
So, let's see, that's now what? I prefer that form. Right. Uh, so, create the. Create. Seriously, create the. Uh, Welcome VM. And we'll do that by. So we do vagrant up, uh, then we log into the VM using vagrant SSH, then We do that by uh, uh, going uh, to be super user, and then uh, shall we? Uh, we don't really need to do anything at this point, do we? So we can just go current directory and told vagrant. Then uh, no. I want to go to slash vagrant and then do docker build minus t minus t vagrant slash i build it uh, dot then uh, so that will build the pi builder uh, image. And then uh, download and patch my Raspberry Pi image. And for this, I'm going to have to go back to my history uh, by doing. I've lost. Uh, cannot be dead then. And then get rid of all of that. Then So that uh, gets our file pistons, file pistons, and then the file system zip, and then we do unzip file system dot zip. Then we do pi pi patch. Uh, oh, actually, and then we do. Uh, and again, we're going to have to go look at our history. There we go, that's the fella.
Oops, not the thing. I can. Oops. Uh, run. Uh, right, so we're, we're running the container referencing the pact. Uh, image. Okay, so, uh, uh, and this time we're doing docker run. Uh, uh, so we're going to run it interactively with the volume set to uh, uh, with this directory because that's the one we've got the patched image in mapped to SD card and we don't actually need to map the port because we're not going to access the Raspberry Pi from outside at the moment uh, so uh, we just need the volume and that looks about right. And you can now connect to the container. So we can just do SSH. Okay. So hopefully right. that'll do. May not be a hundred percent, but it will get us there. Okay, so we're, we're nine tenths of the way there. 
Okay, let's turn our attention now to uh, the CI system. Now, uh, the system of choice for this project is going to be Concourse. Uh, now, Concourse, uh, the, the way Concourse works will be familiar to a lot of people, um, but broadly speaking, you can set up a set of uh, resources and uh, jobs which consist of a um, plan and a series of tasks uh, uh, that constitute a pipeline which basically says given these inputs uh, here are a set of steps that we want you to go through taking inputs and transforming into outputs uh, and for each of those steps uh, we want to just keep a record of the output of that step and whether or not it was successful. Okay, so here's a, uh, a moderately uh, complex pipeline. Uh, believe me, compared to some of the stuff that uh, is available to look at, uh, this is very modest, but it demonstrates the point. Okay, so we've got this booklet uh, input. Okay, which you can see occurs in several places. Uh, in actual fact, it's both an input and an output uh, to this uh, unit task. Okay, so we take we take booklet, feed it into this unit task. This unit task does something and produces an update to the booklet. Then we take the booklet and this version and we put that into this RC task. Okay. And then we output from that RC task an updated booklet and an updated version. Okay. And then the booklet, the version, and the release notes are all fed into this ship task to produce an updated version and then updated release. Now, we don't, the details are not really important. The point is that you've got essentially two types of things. Here. You've got resources, things like booklet and version and release notes, Okay, are uh, sources or sinks of data. Yeah, so they're inputs and outputs. And in between, you've got tasks, which are transformative in some way. Okay, so they take inputs and turn them into outputs. Uh, now, without going into too much detail, you can see some of these are solid lines and some of these are dotted lines. So solid lines are trigger lines. So they're things that will automatically cause the execution of uh, upstream or downstream activities. So in this case, if booklet changes for some reason, that will cause the unit to run, which in turn will output to booklet, which because booklet will have changed, okay, this solid line will cause RC to run automatically, and RC will produce an updated booklet and updated version. The dotted lines are not triggered events, they're simply sources of information or destinations of information, or something like that, sources of information. Okay, so in this case, although RC will read version, if I change version manually, it won't cause RC to automatically update. And that makes perfect sense because this booklet, whatever it is, okay, is obviously the source material, okay, which causes this unit to run, which produces some sort of update which in turn causes RC to run. Now, RC refers to version, but version doesn't trigger it. It's the change to booklet which triggers it, and it produces another update to booklet and an update to version. Okay, so version is updated by RC, uh, but it's not something that will actually cause RC to run. And you can see this ship task is entirely manual. So uh, this would be used for a checkpoint, for example. So it requires a person uh, or something to manually run the ship. The system itself doesn't automatically start this. We know that because none of the inputs are solid lines. Okay, so none of these inputs are trigger states. So even though booklet will be updated by this RC activity, it won't cause ship to actually run. So ship will sit there waiting. Uh, and then when somebody says run the ship, so run ship, it will take booklet version and release notes as its input and produce a new version, a new release. 
Notably, it, it's not producing a new version of Booklet, but one assumes that it will do something like actually deploy lit, uh, Booklet onto some server or something. Uh, or it produces this release, so it produces um, you know, some set of directories or whatever published on the website. Okay. Uh, what else do we need to know? Okay, uh, there's a it, there's a fairly basic but nevertheless useful uh, web interface to this. That's what you're looking at here. This is all part of the web interface. Uh, I don't know why I'm pointing at the point because you can't see it. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so uh, you, you, the the other thing, uh, the other way of interf interfacing to it is via the uh, fly command line utility uh, and that allows you to do pretty much everything you can do through the web interface but it's uh, it's all done through the command line okay so you can actually script all of the activity uh, uh, so with that said uh, let's uh, let's kick off so in order to run this, uh, now we, we we could go to all the trouble of setting up full uh, concourse installation and getting everything working and blah 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 blah. Uh, but there is a, a a sort of quick start, which allows us to uh, install uh, the whole thing in uh, a uh, container. Uh, so uh, we're not going to uh, run all of that stuff. We're going to do this. We're going to we're going to run this Docker container. Okay. So all we need to do is take this compose. Uh, so let's. Uh, okay. We're going to we're going to go over here to our virtual machine. And I'm going to go to the privileged area. Now, I, 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 uh, I don't want to put this into the project, uh, so we will uh, go to our home directory. Okay, and we will make a mm, concourse directory. And uh, go back. Just copy that. Okay. So that gets our uh, uh, Docker compose. So let's just have a quick look at that. Uh, right. Uh, what have we got? So we start with a database, Postgres database uh, set up, and then we are pulling in an image for concourse, and it's running privileged. So there's there's lots of things here that we we, we ought to fix. Now you notice it's running on port 8080, so that's 8080. <laughs> okay, so what this is saying is it's going to take the 8080 from the container. Uh, which will be running the, the web interface, and we're going to map that out to 8080 on this virtual machine. Okay, uh, uh, which, if you remember, we're running with its own private network, so we'll be able to connect to it from outside. We'll look at that in a second. Okay, so that's 8080. Right. Okay, so uh, now all we need to do is actually do Docker uh, hose. Uh, up minus D and ah, we haven't installed Docker Compose, right? So this gives us an opportunity now to have a look at a way. Now, if you remember in the past, okay, we've been looking at this vagrant file, and whenever we've made a change to the provisioning, uh, so provisioning main, which if you recall is the script that gets run. Um, so whenever we've made a change to this, we've destroyed the virtual machine and started again. Well, 
we're, we're now getting to the point where that's not going to be very practical because we've got lots of work on there. So what we'll do, uh, so we're going to install Docker, but we're also going to install uh, the Docker Compose. So, uh, and I think it's just called Docker Compose. Uh, okay, so now, because I've made a change to that, uh, in order to check it, what I can do is I can do vagrant up provision. So what this will do is it will rerun any provisioning within that vagrant file, uh, which if you recall, okay, so the vagrant file, if you've ever, we've only got these two lines of provisioning, okay, uh, and so and the main thing is it's going to run that main script, which we've just edited. And the machine, of course, is, is actually running. Uh, so hopefully, assuming I've guessed right, uh, it will just install that Docker Compose now. And this is the reason, or one of the reasons, why it's very important that your uh, your provisioning scripts are what we call idempotent. In other words, they do the same thing uh, irrespective of the specific context. So in other words, if you run it once, uh, when you run it a second time, it won't cause odd things to happen. Now, hopefully that, yeah, there we go. So we've now got Docker Compose installed and we just leave that to run. So, now, if I go back to the browser, uh, we should be able to, if you remember, if go, uh, going back to the, uh, going back to this and having a look at the Vagrant file, yeah, we put it on its own private network. So we should be able to access it as 3311. And remember, port 80 has been exported so I'm hoping that going back over here, I should be able to go to one one two one six eight dot three three dot one one uh, one one eighty eighty. Once this is finished uh, starting up, now there is something else that I need to do, uh, but we'll cover that in a second. Okay, because this, this is going to only partially work or not work at all. Uh, but Sorry, I know this is a bit dull. Uh, as you can see, we're still downloading. So my internet's been a bit intermittent. Uh, today, not quite sure why. Well, not like I say it's bad. Okay, so it's created the two machines concourse, which is the uh, the web interface and the worker. And the concourse database which is that postgres database which backs it all so now coming back to uh, the browser if we try to connect to that how do we get right so we, we get what we expect okay but if we try and log in we get 404 and that's because it's gone off to this local host right and local host of course is what, what where we actually are uh, which is my Mac, which doesn't have this running. So, back over here, what we need to do is uh, we need to stop uh, concourse, concourse 1. I'll 
stop the database as well. Okay, so now uh, okay, so they're still there until we do prune. Right, so we've got rid of the images. Now if we look at this Docker compose, okay. And the bit that we need to pay attention to is here, the Concourse external URL. Okay, and this is the URL which is going to be put into uh, any uh, any routing information uh, when we access it. So what we need to do is we need to change that local host to be 192.168.33.11. Okay. So now when I start it up, So they're now running again. If we now go back to uh, okay, we now go back to here and we'll go back to one six eight uh, eleven. Okay, so we we'll get this page again, but now when we go here, we're actually getting the correct page. Hurrah! The lashings of ginger beer all red. Okay, so we can actually log in over here uh, and uh, can't remember what the uh, username and password are. I think they are just test. I think it's just test test, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so test test uh, is the username and password for the, is the default. Okay, and we're now logged in. So you can see we've got no pipeline set. Uh, we've got no pipeline set, but we have got instructions here about downloading the command line tool okay so obviously the one we want is this one now if i just download that it's going to download it to my uh, mac so the question is if i just copy that url and come over here the question is if i do a curl on that will it download it to here Hmm, that doesn't look very promising, does it? Now I think that that is that just because hmm, Uh, so what's what's he getting sniffy about there? Uh, uh, well, it would help if I put it in quotes because that question mark will be causing problems because it will be glob. Oh, that's better. Right. So now we've got fly. Uh, give it an execute. Hurrah! Right, okay, so we've now got fly. Good, cool. Okay, so fly is standalone, so uh, let's put that. Uh, we're root, so we can put it anywhere we like. Uh, but we do want to put it somewhere on our path. Okay, so use a local bin. Looks like a possibility. So let's move fly into user local bin. Okay, so now we should be able to, yeah, good, cool. Okay, so we've now got Fly installed. Um, now, in order to be able to uh, issue commands to this, we need to uh, first log in, which means getting a, a token. Uh, and the way this works is all Fly commands, you give them a target, a minus T. And we'll keep it short uh, in order that... Uh, uh, it saves a bit on typing. Uh, so we'll do flight minus TCI and we will just log in. And I think you don't need to supply anything. I think you, it will prompt you for username and password. So let's try that. Ah, unknown target. Uh, anyway, have I, do I just do fly login? Yeah, I thought so. Maybe it is fly login minus T. Hmm. 
Well, of course he's, of course he's unknown. Okay. Memory's failed me. So, go back here. Oh, I suppose it helps if you actually give it somewhere to lock into. Uh, they supply the username and password as well, and they called it tutorial, but tutorial seems like an awful lot of typing to me, so uh, we will copy that line. But, uh, and we can actually log into localhost in this case. Uh, what do we do? CI. There we go. So we're now logged into team main and the target has been saved. Uh, so we should be able to do everything now with my CI in front of it. Yeah. Not very interesting. Uh, we list the available teams. So it's just the one at the moment. Uh, list the registered workers, uh, which is just this Linux box that we're currently running on. Anyway, uh, okay, so we've now got uh, concourse basically installed. Uh, so what we now need to do is think about uh, how this is going to actually work. Uh, we're going to have a pipeline consisting of some sources and some tasks. So the first task we want to do is take a an image file and patch it. So we want to actually run the pipatch script that we've written. Uh, so we want to run this pipac script okay, uh, against uh, some arbitrary image file and produce as output uh, an image file which has been patched with uh, the SSH change and the certificates for the Pi. So uh, we can do that using a standard command. And if we tweak Pi, patch Pi, we could actually have it do the copy as well. But I don't want to do that. I'll, I'll do that as a separate step. Uh, so it's a two-step process. Take the input image file, copy it somewhere, patch it, and then take that as the output of that step. Then we take the output of that step, which is the patched image, feed that into the next step, which is actually to run it up using uh, the Luke Charles VM that we've customized. Okay, so that's the new thing that we've built, uh, which we call the Pi Builder. Uh, and the other input to that will be whatever set of script we want. And then we need that task to take those scripts, load them onto the Pi, run the scripts, uh, and then take whatever the resulting image of that is, once we've shut it all down, uh, as the output to that task. All right, so uh, let's see if I can describe that. Uh, ooh. Okay, my ancient will wake on. Uh, right, so uh, let's just change for you. Okay. Okay, so um, we want to take uh, an input here, okay, which is our raw image and I want to take that in to a task. Ooh. Tell you what, something's causing a lot of lag. 
Uh, so I'll take that into our task. Okay, and this is going to do the. Oh dear, this is very laggy. Patch. Oh, blimey. Okay, and um, it's going to produce an output with a new image. Right, and we're going to take that image and, oh dear. Oh, that wasn't actually you. Mm. Mm. Right. Oh, something got a bit stuck there. Right, so we're going to take that image and we're going to. So this is the image.p, so image patched. Uh, and we're going to take that into the next process step, which is also going to take, uh, let's call them just scripts. I suppose that was being a bit ambitious. Okay, so the scripts will be taken as input as well. Okay, and this will be our, let's call it mangle. Okay, so mangle will produce just a new image M. Which will actually be something we can load onto a Raspberry Pi. Okay. And will be whatever the scripts tell it to add. Ooh, blimey, it's not pulling teeth. Right, so that's the plan of action. So these two things, patch and mangle, will both need to be containers of some description. Okay, now this one, Mangle, okay, this is going to be the, the Pi Builder image we've already defined. Uh, I, I promise you, I can actually write Pi Builder, okay, uh, plus uh, the stuff to make the stuff to run the scripts. Okay. I think I'm going to have to invest in a more modern tablet. Um, okay, and this one, the patch, it can just be uh, a Debian light inside which we will run the Pi patch script. Uh, uh, plus a copy command, I suppose. Okay, so the copy command will just copy this image to somewhere like the output, and then the Pi patch will patch that image, and that will provide as output, which will then go as input to the mangle, which will actually be the Pi builder plus a script runner, which will run these scripts, uh, apply them to this image to produce the output of the image M. Okay, and then what happens to this? It will go on to a Raspberry Pi, or in in this case, I suppose, it will go to some kind of binary repository, ready to be loaded onto uh, wherever. Okay. Oh, enough of that. I'm really going to have to sort that out. It's very very laggy. Right. All right then. Uh, okay. Right. So, 
uh, definitely gonna have to sort my diagramming out. <laughs> right. right, so we've got all the parts that we want, uh, and I think I'm gonna call that it for a bit. Uh, because uh, poop here needs to be fed, we probably need to go out okay. and maybe do a bit more later this afternoon or this evening. Failing that, we'll do another session. Okay. Right, okay, so we've got a plan of action, we've got most of the bits that we need, uh, the rest of it's straightforward. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm going to call that it. Uh, and I will see you in the next session.